Yeah, so I'm grateful to be here and I bring you greetings from my husband, Simon. He traveled to Kitale where he is hosting, um, facilitating a men's conference all the way there. You know, that is what his heart beats for. And so he's, it's very difficult for him to pass up an opportunity to be ministering to men. So he sent me with greetings and said, see you next Sunday. <laughs> yes, yeah, so he will be here next Sunday. Um, would you allow me to pray as we share the word of God today? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for what you have to say to us today. We pray that you'll open up our hearts to receive from you and want to ask that you um, will cause us to comprehend and to receive and to embrace and to run and be transformed by what you have to share with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. So I want to, to start by reading um, uh, Proverbs 31. And I know that uh, a lot of women don't like this chapter. They hate it. They feel that uh, the standards are set too high, that they are unachievable. Are there haters of uh, Psalms 31 here? Uh, Proverbs 31. <laughs> it's in your heart. It's a beautiful, beautiful scripture. Uh, so allow me to read from verse 10. Um, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation. Uh, it's, uh, and the title of this particular top, uh, chapter or segment of the chapter is The Radiant Bride. Uh, so it says, who could ever find a wife like this one? She is a woman of strength and mighty valor. She is full of wealth and wisdom. The price paid for her was greater than many jewels. Um, her husband has entrusted his heart to her, for she brings him the rich spoils of victory. All throughout her life, she brings him what is good and not evil. She searches out continually to possess that which is pure and righteous. She delights in the work of her hands. Verse 14, she gives out relevant truth to feed others. She's like a trading ship bringing divine supplies from the merchant. Even in the night season, she arises and sets food on the table for hungry ones in her house and for others. She sets her heart upon a nation and takes it as her own, carrying it within her. She labors there to plant the living vines. She wraps herself in strength, might, and power in all her works. She tastes and experiences a better substance, and her shining light will not be extinguished, no matter how dark the night. She stretches out her hands to help the needy, and she lays hold of the wills of government. She is known by her extravagant generosity to the poor, for she always reaches out her hands to those in need. She's not afraid of tribulation, for all her household is covered in the dual garments of righteousness and grace. Her clothing is beautifully knit together, a purple gown of exquisite linen. Her husband is famous and admired by all, sitting as the venerable judge of his people. Even her works are righteous of righteousness, even her works of righteousness she does for the benefit of her enemies. Bold power and glorious majesty are wrapped around her as she loves with joy, as she laughs with joy over the latter days. Her teachings are filled with wisdom and kindness. As loving instruction pours from her lips. She watches over the ways of her household. She meets every need they have. Her sons and daughters arise in one accord to extol her virtues. And her husband arises to speak of her in glowing terms. There are many valiant and noble ones, but you have ascended above them all. Charm can be misleading, and beauty is vain and so quickly fades. But the, this virtuous woman lives in the wonder, awe, the fear of God. She will be praised throughout eternity. So go ahead and give her the credit that is due, for she has become a radiant woman, and all her loving works 
of righteousness deserve to be admired at the gateways of every city. Isn't that amazing? Um, I'll just read a, a little commentary here to just build up a, a little background on femininity. I know we are talking about femininity today and what that means for prayer for us as we pray. And I don't want the men in the congregation to switch off on me right now. Men, do you promise not to check out? <laughs> yeah? Uh, please don't check out. Patrick, don't check out on me. <laughs> yeah, so um, there's a commentary here that says, starting with verse 10 through at the end of this book, we have a, a Hebrew acoustic poem. Um, it is alphabetical in structure, with each of the 24 verses beginning with a consecutive Hebrew letter of the alphabet. And the implication is that perfections of this woman would not exhaust the entire language. Um, the, the subject is a perfect bride, a virtuous woman, and this woman is both a picture of a virtuous wife and an incredible allegory of the end time victorious bride of Jesus Christ, full of virtue and grace. So I hope that that lifts off the pressure of you, uh, Pastor Faith, uh, that it's not about, it's not really about what we, this is not about putting us down as women or, you know, um, setting standards that are unattainable, that are not reachable, but it's a bigger picture of the bride of Christ. And the commentator here continues to say that the Hebrew word that is used to describe this virtuous word, wife is kail. I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it right. And the meaning of this word can be, cannot be contained in one English equivalent word. It is often used in connection with one, military prowess. Um, and so this is a warring woman. It's a warrior woman. Kayil can also be translated as mighty, as wealthy, as excellent, morally righteous, full of substance, integrity, abilities and strength, and mighty like an army. And so the Proverbs 31 woman is therefore a metaphor for the last day's church, the virtuous overcoming bride of Jesus. And it is also used to describe men, um, but valiant men. And you can see that in Exodus 18, 21. Um, really just to say that as we talk about women and we can begin to go into our, the media team can begin to run those slides. Oh, by the way, I came with my daughter, uh, Covenant. Uh, she's our first and I also came with my last, who has gone to the teens' church. Uh, concerning this first, uh, the father and I have set up a vetting committee. We are receiving applications for would-be uh, sons-in-law. So, but on a light note, Covenant, please just wave. <laughs> she's a bit shy, uh, but there she is. Can you see she's young and lovely? <laughs> yeah, so she sent me a message this morning when they were told, we were told to send uh, messages to mommy. She sent me one, and it was very heartwarming. Thank you. So I want to talk about godly femininity and prayer. Um, I believe my husband did talk about godly masculinity and prayer. Um, Eve is made in God's image. If you read Genesis 1, 27 to 28, um, it talks about, you know, God, it's, it's the creation story. And, you know, God was making this and making that, making the moon, making the sun, and all of the things that he made. And every time he created something, he, he evaluated his own work. And he said, and he did this, and he saw that it was good. But there is only one instance where the Lord proclaims his own assessment of what he was doing was that it was not good, okay? And he said, it is not good for man to be alone. And so um, it is not good for man to be alone. And so he went ahead and made Eve. And when he made Eve, who is referred to as Ezra, the original 
word, Hebrew word for Eve is actually Ezra. Uh, and now that our brother talked about uh, the Man Enough program, we have the Woman Enough program, and we call it the Ezra program. I'm sure that uh, we'll be able to see how that can be availed for the women here as they study, as the men do the Man Enough program. Then we can do Ezra. So Eve is referred to as Ezra. Um, and Ezra uh, is also a, a, is a Hebrew word that has over a hundred references in the Bible um, the, the, as, as a root. You know, words that are derived from the root word Eve, there are over a hundred um, references, including the word Ebenezer, Ebenezer. So the last word Ezra is help. Um, when we read in John 14 and Jesus is leaving and saying, to his uh, apostles that I'm going, but I'm going to leave you a, a helper. It is the same word, Ezra, which is, uh, refers to a woman, which also refers to God. And so Genesis chapter 1, the creation story, you know, God says it is not good for man to be alone. And so God speaks to himself. They have a meeting. Um, God had a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they say, let us make man in our likeness. And it says, male and female, he created them in God's image and likeness. And so when we hear the word helper, we think about that word as something that is a bit low in class. You know, um, we, we don't receive it as a word that is powerful, that dignifies us as women, but it is actually a powerful word. And we say that, you know, um, humanity or humankind is like two pieces of the puzzle. So both men and women together complete the full expression of the image and the likeness of God. So one without the other is incomplete. And that's why God says it is not good. And he was saying this thing is not complete. There's something missing. I need to put in one final touch. And that one final touch happened to be the creation of Eve. And then he said, now it is very good. It is very good. He, 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 um, you know, he, 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 he amplified or rather he qualified the goodness of what he did. And you notice in scripture, after he was done creating Eve, he has not created anything else. So we can easily say that as women, we are God's latest, uh, latest model, <laughs> latest creation, uh, wonderfully made, fearfully made. Um, so we were talking about this and saying that our role therefore becomes to relate and to rule, to relate and to rule. We rule out of relationship. And women are, you know, said to be the ones that are physiologically wired to be relational. We are relational. Everything about us is relational. Um, I remember when we had our children and uh, they seemed to enjoy a ride on mother's hips. Uh, daddy didn't have a seat for them. <laughs> but when they needed to feel the security of, of daddy, then he was there. But we are physiologically wired to carry on in a very special way uh, the the you know the the, the creation I mean the, the work of to carry on creation um, from where God stopped it <laughs> He delegated us to, delegated it to us so we are saying that we need to understand as women that God has given us special abilities when He tells us uh, calls us help us. You know, a lot of feminists stop there and say, you know, the Bible is misogynic. It doesn't, um, it doesn't elevate women. It brings down women, puts down women. But that is not the case, as you have seen. Um, a Bible scholar called Freeman says that Ezra is a combination of two words, to save uh, or rescue and to be strong. And so... When God creates woman, it's not about hierarchy. He is not placing woman below or beneath man, but he is creating her as a helper 
meet for him, a helper who is comparable, yet different, yet valuable to him. And together they express the image of God. So as it's about, um, um, you know, really a, a, pos a position of strength, um, it's a pronoun, it's a, it's a noun at the same time, which means to defend, to protect, to surround, to cherish, and to be as a therefore is to be strong, is to exercise a divinely given power. It is also to be proactive, but it's also to be vulnerable because we see Jesus living his throne in heaven, living his godhood and becoming and subjecting himself to the vulnerability of being human. And so when we talk about God giving us power, we are not speaking about it in a way, in a sense that inflates our minds and makes us think that we are better than women, and I mean than men. Um, and, and you know, there's this catchphrase that flies around that what a man can do, a woman can do better. Um, I dare say that that word is totally uh, out of order because we are not competing. Who is competing? There is no competition. There is only complementarity. We are called to complement each other, that together we present the full image of God. And so we are called to rule and relate. And how does this relate to prayer? Uh, first of all, we are to be fruitful. We are to be fruitful. Um, it is the mandate that God has given to both men and women. Adam and Eve were commanded to be fruitful and to have dominion. Both of them were built in God's image. So none is above the other. In terms of role, I mean, there are those things that men are expected to do. There are those roles that women are expected to do. It's part of divine order, but it doesn't... Uh, like I say, imply hierarchy, it just implies divine order, how God made things to be. And remember, he said that it is good. So femininity is a gift to be celebrated, pretty much a masculinity. Uh, but we also see that um, culturally, this is not the image that we have carried. And I'll talk about some of, of our rites of passage, beginning from birth. And, you know, we have this thing, what happened when a male child was born amongst the, let me talk about the Kikuyu community. They are the dominant ones. We hear they are the Israelites, the Jews of this country. I don't know who said so, but I have heard it is said. Have you heard it? Yeah? Anyway, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, propagating, I'm not passing on propaganda. I'm just saying what I had. So there's, so what happens? Don't pretend to be very Nairobian. What happens when you give birth to a boy? Do you know? Hmm? Oh, relations. Relations is what? Yeah, that one. Now you know. So how many did we give for, for women, for girls and for, and for boys? And what was the implication? Why didn't we make them equal? Okay, we don't know. We found these things being done. But there are very many cultural uh, practices or beliefs that are carried that sort of seem to put femininity and masculinity as a matter of hierarchy, competition, you know, comparison that one is preferred over the other. And you know that until recently, as a woman, you were not a mother until you had a son. If you were just a mother of girls, then you were not woman enough. Yeah? And so we had all sorts of things, so all sorts of strategies that are trying to correct that thing. But like I say, that is not how God views femininity. In our brokenness as human beings, we interpret it, we practice it differently, but it was not so from the beginning. God values women. God um, expresses himself through women as he does through men. And uh, we could say a lot about that. Um, women have been depicted as objects of uh, you know, sensual pleasure in many ways. 
um, and, you, and you, you can see it in the adverts. Anything you try to sell has, you know, a curvy woman around it. From PK, the chewing gum, to what else do they sell? What else? Cars, you know, even cooking oil, pwani, uh, what is that thing called? Fresh fry. Yes, everything is being sold. There's a, there's a beautiful, there's a, you know, the picture of a very beautiful woman there. And really what we are saying is that we are presenting the woman as an object of pleasure. And we pick this up as women. We pick up insecurities. And you see, somebody say that there, there, there is a whole industry that is built around the insecurities of women. You know, if you don't like your hair, you can, you can buy what you like, what you wish God had given you, including the calves. These days you can buy. If your mama didn't give it to you, you can purchase it. You can make it your your own. We have very many options. A lot of insecurities. And they say that, you know, the day women will stand as secure, a lot of people will go out of business. Because we'll stop using some things. And I'm not attacking you. Please go ahead and use what you're using freely. I'm just saying that there's a lot that we have refused to accept. There's somebody who has defined a certain standard of beauty for women. You know, the right size of hips, the right size of the, bu uh, of the bust. Which one is the right one? Who measures? What is the standard measurement? Who says what is right? Yeah? Do, do we feel that we have what is okay? Or are we forever trying to enhance it? And so I tell women, the right size of whatever you have is what you have. Is what God made. And he said it was very good. All right? It is very good. And if we don't begin from that place of embracing what God has given it as it, us as it is, um, then we begin to go off. We cannot carry the, bad, the burden of God for his world, for our communities, for ourselves, if we are wallowing in, um, if we are caught up in all manner of insecurities. So there are all of those things in some cultures, uh, religious cultures, um, like our brothers uh, from who descended from, um, to say they descended from who? From Ishmael. You know, for you to give witness as a woman, you have to be two of you for it to be admitted as the witness of a whole person. Do you understand? So those are some of the ways that the enemy fights femininity as God created it to be. But I, I want you to take it from his word today that God was very intentional. And when he speaks about the bride, when you talk about the Proverbs 31 woman, we're not just talking about the female species of humanity. We are talking about the bride of Christ. And as a bride of Christ, we all, men, men and women, we all are the bride of Christ. We all carry that identity as a bride of Christ. And this person, that this husband that is actually being praised in um, Proverbs 31 could easily be, uh, you know, a, a, a type of Christ that is being celebrated out of the Old Testament. And so we want to talk about then the four faces of a woman. First, we see a woman as a servant queen because we have power. If man is, create, man is created to be king, then who is a king without a queen? Is there a king without a queen? No. There are reasons. So there are queens, but like we said, queen, queening is about being strong, having the power to help. The person who helps is not a weak person. Isn't that so? Think about the Holy Spirit. He is powerful, and he bears the name helper, as we do as women. And in Romans 8.26, they say that sometimes we don't know how to pray, but the Holy Spirit groans and prays within us with language, a language that we cannot understand. So there is a lot of power that we wield as women, power that is, has been vested to us for building up the kingdom of God. And we need to carry this 
responsibility with the seriousness that it deserves. So we are called to be queens. We are called to be women of integrity. In Proverbs 31 uh, verse 10, we read it. I mean, it talks about who could ever find a wife like this one. She's a woman of strength and mighty valor. She is full of wealth and wisdom. She is rich. She is in a position to lift others, to help, to, uh, to, you know, to remove burdens, which is what prayer is about. Prayer is about lifting burdens. Prayer is about standing in a position of authority and lifting other people up. And so as women, as queens, we are called to be warriors. We have read the commentary that says uh, the word that is used to describe the woman in Proverbs 31 connotes war, someone who is willing to fight. We have had the story of a mother there who was willing to fight for the well-being of her children. So she lay her dignity down. You know, she was no longer walking daintily, you know, towards this her child that was hurt. She was running. Dignity down. There was a life to save. There was a child in trouble, and she needed to give an appropriate response. And so that was that is who we see as a queen, a servant queen, who first of all walks in integrity. Um, secondly, who is responsible? And res the word responsible is derived from two root words: uh, response and ability. And so proactiveness is about seeing something that calls for your response and going ahead to actually offer the response that is required. And then, of course, we talk about wisdom. Queens are the embodiment of wisdom. And the word of God tells us that the beginning of all wisdom is the fear of God. And so to exercise our queenly power and authority, we have to begin with the fear of God. And I know that we are talking about femininity. And by the way, I've seen some very nice things here. I hope the pastor can get to pick a few and, <laughs> and go home with them. Her choice. Um, that is besides the point. I'm getting distracted. Uh, but um, so, so the four faces. First is a queen, a servant queen. Secondly is a dedicated nurturer. As women, we are nurturers. As women... We receive life. We receive seed into us. Single speed, microscopic. And nine months down the line, we give forth life that has been multiplied, enhanced, perfected. And so when you talk about naturals, I don't want to just think about being a biological mom. Being a natural is about enhancing, lifting, adding value. And whether you are a biological mom or not, there are numerous opportunities for you to add life to your spaces, to multiply what you're given. Um, and so, of course, uh, motherhood is one of those very express ways where we experience and practice our nurturing uh, uh, manner. But like I say, it doesn't necessarily have to be confined to being a biological mom. There are very many things that you can give life to and enhance. So what does a dedicated natural do? Um, like I say, they support, mothers support, mothers root for their children, uh, mothers care, and, and we nurture life. We teach, mother is first educator, mother is first doctor, nurse, chef. What else are we? All of those things. I remember when we were younger, you know, these days they have, uh, they have really made life easier for moms. But we used to go to church with a whole kiondo. You know, there was, there was a kitchen there, mobile kitchen, mod, mobile wardrobe. You know, I mean, there were so many things that we carried. Life has become much better these days. When I go to Sunus, I'm like, where were these things? When us guys were giving birth, they were not there. We just survived the hard way. Uh, so um, a natural cares, there are numerous opportunities for us to care. And you see, intercession is about standing in the gap for other people. And you cannot stand in the gap if you don't care. You have to be moved by the infirmity and the limitations of the people who stand as the object of your prayer. And so 
We are called to be naturers. We are called to nurture the purposes of God. Um, when we pray the, the Lord's Prayer, we say, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And the implication is that there is a disparity between God's perfect will on earth and what we, exp I mean, in heaven and what we experience on earth. And that gap then becomes the object, the subject of our prayer. So we are to nurture God's purposes. What are God's purposes? God's purpose is that no man should perish. I like the testimony of the mom who stood in the gap so that her husband would not perish, but would come to the saving knowledge of Christ. And there are very many mothers that are constantly interceding through the various stages of life. I remember when um, you know, I got married, I, I moved out of home, my parents would call me still and say, did you eat breakfast? What have you done? They were still caring. You never stop caring. It's a full-time job. The need or the way in which you need to parent your children may change, but it never ends. You know, when we get married and our spouse goes, our names change. You become, you know, a widow or a widower. But when your father or mother does, you, you, you still remain. You, 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 re, you retain the, the title daughter or son. And even from the grave, my father still fathers me. And I'm not implying that because I'm Kamba, I do some funny things. That is not what I am. That's not where I am going. Because I can see some of you looking at me funnily when I say that my father still fathers me even though he's been gone for many years. How does he father me? He, he instilled values in me. The things that he told me, I have never forgotten those things. And there are many times when I find myself faced in a situation and I ask myself, what would my father do? What would he say? Isn't he parenting me still, even though he's long gone? So parenting, and I'm talking about parenting because we're talking about an aspect of womanhood that involves parenthood and to say that you know what does a parent do what does a mother do a mother advises a mother nurtures a mother helps so whether you are actual an actual mom or not you have an opportunity to be a nurturer um, in the spaces god has given you to nurture the spiritual burdens that god puts in your heart to nurture them until god's will on earth aligns with our experience. I mean, God's will in heaven aligns with our earthly experience. Um, and we have examples, Hannah. And I like to say, when, when you talk about uh, prayer in uh, Ombi, we say that, you know, Hannah used to, used to go and say, oh, give me a child, give me a child. But I don't think it's a coincidence that in Hannah's time, there was a gap. There was no priest. It was in the days when everybody did what they wanted. And Hannah attached her prayer to a need that was in the, in, 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 I mean, in the, existed. A priest, a prophet for the God's people. And I think the moment she said, God, give me a son who I will give back to you. I think God said, wait, wait, wait. Did you hear what she asked? Do you realize we need somebody? And quickly she had this boy. And she gave him back, uh, you know. And he became Israel's first prophet and priest um, at the same time. So we can nurture, we can identify, we are called as women to identify gaps, areas of disparity between what God's will is and what our experience on earth is and identify those and nurture the purposes of God so that then God's will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, so the first face of a woman, we said it's a what? Servant queen. Second is dedicated natural. Um, the third one is a loyal wife or mate. I know some of you who are not wives yet are sort of letting that one pass. Uh, <laughs> but being a wife is maybe the most intimate, um, expression of partnership but like we're saying what do what do wives do what do partners do they are committed 
we have opportunities to be committed. Again, intercessory re uh, prayer requires that we give a commitment, that we are committed to seeing God's will come on earth as it is in heaven. And as women, uh, we are good. Women love hard. They do, don't we? Ishoi, you're shaking your head. What do you know about how women love? <laughs> or it is what you have experienced. <laughs> okay. For a moment there, I was thinking something was happening. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, women love hard. And so we say you, you need to love fast wisely before you love deeply. Because we also have the capability of loving very foolishly as women. Um, so um, we, are, we are asked to, as partners, as wives, we are called to be committed. We are called to be submish, submitted. And that's another S word that women don't like to hear about. But Jesus did submit to his father. So submission is power and strength that has been brought under control. He willingly submitted to his father. It didn't make him less a part of the Godhead, but he knew in this season, this is who I need to be. And everywhere he went, when, when Mary you know, was asking him to turn water into wine, he said, wait, I only do what my father does. It was not his time. He was waiting to see what his father was doing so that he was submitted to it. And so we are called to be submitted. And to be submitted is not to, again, um, reduce our influence or reduce our significance. In fact, it takes somebody who is extremely secure in who they are, in their knowledge of who God is and who has called them to truly submit. And so submission is a true manifestation of power and of strength, yet manifesting in humility. And to be supportive. Um, that is who we are. That is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is our namesake, as women, he is called a helper. Do you think that the work of the Holy Spirit is any less a duty as far as what the Godhead does? Do you think that it is less? No, it is powerful. It is who has been left here on earth to teach us, to remind us, to, I mean, to lead us in the way that we should, to help us pray. And so when we call women to submit, we are calling them to a beautiful and powerful opportunity to influence just as God has called us to be. And we have examples in the Bible, various of them. Um, Abigail is one of those who was very powerful, but yet who submitted you know, to the authority and the need of David and his army of people. So we've seen that the faces of woman is servant, queen, dedicated, natural, loyal partner or wife, um, and finally, um, a faithful friend. And we are called to be faithful, to commit for the long haul, not to give up, not to give up. And we did read um, in Proverbs 31, verse 16, 18, it says, she tastes and experiences a better substance and her shining light will not be extinguished no matter how dark the night. And we go through dark nights of relational experiences where we have been betrayed, where our expectations have not been met, where we have been abused, but we should not give up on what God says to us. We should not give up or, you know, trash what God calls us to be and to do. And so we are called to be faithful. We are called to love. And I really love also um, what it says. Um, I'm just quickly looking for that uh, scripture. Where it talks about that, yes, I found it in 24. It says, even her works of righteousness, she does for the benefit of her enemies. Who does that? Except by the power of God. Who does things to benefit their enemies? 
Ask your friend, when did you do a thing to benefit your enemy? Last. When? Have you? Would you consider it? <laughs> Not possible. Yeah? It is possible. Do you know you were God's enemy, yet he did a lot of things for your benefits? Yeah, we were God's sworn enemies, lost in sin, rebellious. But he did things that were beneficial to us. Scripture says that when we were yet lost in our sin, Christ died for us. So as we grow in righteousness, we should not find it strange to do certain things that will benefit our enemies. Because it's a godly thing. It's what God does. It's what Ezra does. And I'm not now calling you to be an enabler of bad behavior. That, that is something quite different. This is a call to respond to what God has called us to be. Who God has called us to be. How God has called us to be. And so as faithful friends, we do not give up the future because of the present. We have a long-term view of what is happening. And so we do not allow the present moment to distract us from the goal. We set our eyes on the goal, you know, like a flint, and we go for it, even when there are distractions. So as faithful friends, as loyal friends, God calls us to pursue with a lot of faith, unwavering faith, to pursue the purposes of God and not to give up in the face of trouble, not to give up in the face of hardship, not to give up when we are going through a dark season of the night. And so we are called to pray, and that's how then um, we manifest um, prayer and we manifest intercession in the spaces that God has called us to be. And I pray that even as we sit here, we, yes, we are listening as the women, but I'm saying that this touches on all of us, male and female. But today, we are talking about the women. And so I want to conclude our time um, just again by, um, to, by, by just um, saying that as women, we are relational and we are called to use our emotional strength, our words and deep love to pray and intercede, to carry the burdens of work uh, of God in our hearts and to support them in prayer until we push it through and it's coming through um, as answered prayer. We are to use our spiritual wombs to conceive the seed of what God wants to be and to nurture it until we bring forth the purposes of God. And we have very many mothers in the Bible that, you know, exemplify this for us very beautifully. And so may we receive the grace to arise and be Ezra in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for listening, for your attention, and may the Lord bless his word. Thank you so much, Pastor Sophie, for those affirming words. When we were asked to share about our moms, I turned to Pastor Sophie and she told me her mom is 91 years of age. And, um, she, and I, I asked her, goodness, so you have such nice genes, so you're okay for a while. And, and she said, you know, one of the things that her mom is going through is, you know, the old age that comes with many things. But one of the resolute spaces she has stuck as a mom is a place of prayer. So she prays about everything. Lord, help me sit down properly. Lord, help me stand. Those are real prayers. This morning, I want us to pray for the women in our congregation. Earlier this morning, we had come in prayer for the men, and we called on the heavens from our sermon last Sunday for the men in our midst, our husbands, our fathers, our brothers, our sons, just the place of warfare that it, it has felt for the main, men amongst us. But this morning, we want, want also to affirm the women and the challenges of womanhood and, and what it means, therefore, to live out your femininity in the way God has asked of you. 
this book was given to me as a gift and I thought I'd love to share this with the women around us for two things. One, I started filling it out with my mom. When I visit her, I had told her, mom, we need to be filling out this book because I want to hear your story. I want to hear your journey because somehow it will affirm me in my own journey and the challenges you went through. So one of the first pages says, says, mom, Tell me as much as you can remember about where you were born. Was it raining? What are your earliest memories? What did your feet wear? What did you see? What did you hear when you were young? What, was your, what is your first memory as a child? Did you fight with your siblings? Who were you closest to? Who did you play with? What did you play with? Who are your neighbors? And it documents a mom's journey and allows for this gift to be passed on. Then I thought, I need to give this to my children and for them to ask me my story. Except my children are boys. And their attention is a little challenging. Maybe that's what we should pray. So maybe I should just write my own story myself and I buy a second book because I'm not sure that, I don't know, how many men here will sit with their moms and look at them shaking their heads. God is watching you. Why wouldn't you want to document the truth? of a woman, a godly woman's journey who has reinforced you. But that's a challenge. So ladies and gentlemen, please pick a book and document your mom. And if she, they're not here with you, try and ask the aunties and the people around, do you remember my mom in a particular way? What can we, in passing on some of these affirming godly women in our lives to the next generation, how can we document this? Because it is such a gift to document the journeys of our moms. I'm going to ask all the, men in, um, all the women in our midst to please stand up. As a woman, God has called you to live out your femininity fully. And I know in our society, there are many challenges that we face as women. Pastor Sophie has just gleaned a little about that. We are seen in a particular way. We are perceived in a particular way. Our workplaces are challenging. Um, and somehow, perhaps we hold back. Perhaps we need to completely surrender um, who we are as women before the Lord, and then ask him to continue affirming us in our weaknesses and in our insecurities. But also remember that these things that Pastor Sophie has brought to us are our godly identity, and we shouldn't hold back for them. I'm going to ask um, Dr. Walter Jaoko to please come and pray on behalf of the men. I know you have daughters, and you have a wife, and, and all the things you have desired for the women in your life. We want your blessing as a representation of the men here. So if you're a man, please just stretch your hands out to the woman next to you or behind you or wherever they are, just as a blessing over the women in our midst, that God would hear us as we work as partners together. So let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this afternoon with gratitude in our hearts for who you are and who you mean to us. We thank you for the privilege of being called your children. We thank you for the sacrifice that you gave of your son, Jesus Christ, that we may have a relationship with you to do the forgiveness of sin. So today, Lord, we just want to thank you for the word that. Pastor Sophie has shared with us around womanhood. We thank you for the privilege of relating to women as our mothers, as our sisters, as our wives. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you've given us in these relationships. We pray now, Lord, for the women standing and for the ones that uh, have had this sermon uh, online, we just want to bring them before you. You know their inner self, you know the struggles that they go through, you know the joys that you provide to them, you know the experiences that they pass through each day, and we just want to commit them, Lord, into your hands. That they'll be not just hearers of the word that you've shared with us this uh, day, but they'll also be doers of it. That they'll be encouraged by the words that uh, you've given us through uh, Pastor Sophie. That they are strong. That they should not uh, 
view themselves as weaker partners, but that you created them to be helpers, which does not mean in any way inferiority, but a source of strength. So, Father, we pray that you walk with them, that you strengthen them in their walk with you, that you strengthen them even as they become, continue to become pillars of the homes in which you've raised them. And we pray for those who might not be in a position of motherhood, as has been shared this day, that there'll be a source of encouragement to others as well, that they'll continue to nurture the people around them, and that further above all, that they'll grow in the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ, and that they'll be con continue to become ambassadors of Christ wherever you place them. So, Father, I just commit the women in this congregation into your hands. May you help them to serve their, your, their purposes on earth. As I've said of David, that when David had served your purposes in his generation, he fell asleep and was buried with his ancestors. So, Father, we pray for the women standing here that they will learn to serve your purposes in their generation. So we commit them to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, please stand up and let's conclude our service. Thank you for being a part of our conversation. Affirm every lady as you walk out this morning as gentlemen. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and show you his peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us, all of us, now and forevermore. And God's people said, wonderful to see you. We'll see you next week. God bless you. We have tea and everything else that accompanies it. Please just, is it still there? I'm just seeing darkness. Please don't uh, stay behind and mingle and get to know one another. Thank you so much.